a book that intrigues and affects every essence of your humanity, a dark and terrible tale told in a lyrical, poetic language and stark imagery. This is humane, passionate and true. Could you please welcome to the Twilight School stage, Sophie Laguna. Thank you. Sophie, um, I was assuming that you still lived in Altona, so can we just assume that for the first part of the Yeah, interview? I mean, I'm happy to talk about yeah. Altona. I love Altona. Um, I love the refinery there. Mm. I love some of those roads that leads into those kind of areas. Mm. And, of course, all those areas that I love so much and Cherry Lake, and mm. they're all there in that beautiful book, The Eye of the Sheep. They are. Before we get on to the book, mm. I, I was interested in the idea... We hear a lot about Aborigines and their connection to land and their connection to, 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 to place. How important was that place to you? How deeply does Altona kind of get into you? We moved to Altona and there I was in that um, place of so many contradictions, such beauty, such staggering natural beauty juxtaposed against this quite brutal, muscular um, industry. And I was, I was deeply affected by, I think, that tension between the two. Um, and so um, I had a very young child at the time. He was 18 months old when I began to write this book. I already had the characters there in my imagination. I needed the right kind of um, home and workplace for them. And, and Altona suited me perfectly. It was very much under my skin. I, I was moved by it. I was disappointed by it. I was... Mystified. Does it have to be under your skin, to use your words, in order for it to be, to be translated into such a real kind of place within your writing? So much of it's not conscious. I think I did have a passionate response to, to that suburb. It was like, no, Al Altona's a really unique place, it is. isn't it? Yeah. When I'd moved in, apparently there was only one set of traffic lights because it's not a thoroughfare yeah. to anywhere. So yeah. if you're going to Altona, there's only one reason and it's to, to be there. Yeah. Um, and it, it, was, it was a striking sort of a place. It was distressing at the same time. Each morning we would wake up to a different kind of a chemical scent in the air. At the same time as, as a flock of 26, I, all, I counted pelicans every day, mm. I, as a flock of 26 pelicans would seem to follow you home as you came back from the city. Can, you're in a lift, Sophie. You're taking your manuscript to, to your publisher. Yep. You're going up 20 flights, OK? Yep. And Mr Stranger gets in and yeah. goes, what have you got in your bag? And you go, I've got a novel. Mm -hmm. And he goes, in 20 flights of a very fast-moving mm -hmm. lift, tell me what it's about. <laughs> That's such a hard question. I know. And, and one is asked on. so often and sometimes on television. Yeah, so you have to try. string the words you know, neatly together. Yeah, so it's really about a boy. It is a book uh, about a boy called Jimmy Flick. And, you know, it's often been told to me that it's a book about domestic violence or it's a book about being marginalised or a book about alcohol. It, it is none of those things. It's not a book about those things. It's a book about a boy called Jimmy. And when the book opens, he's about six. And he's an, he's an unconventional boy. He sees the world in surprising and imaginative ways. And it is the story of how he... Um, how he manages his challenging circumstances. How did, how did I go? Oh, that's wonderful. That, that's what it's about. <laughs> so if I brought you back tomorrow and said the same thing, you'd have a totally different probably, kind of concoction probably. of words. No, I'm, I've had to think about it lately because somebody said to me, who had a very passionate and positive response to the book, said, you know, I read somewhere that it was about domestic violence. And... The, and because, because we're having a public now conversation, finally, about domestic violence, yeah. then, then it's, then it's um, you know, and it's topical, then, then that's the way my book is described. It sure. sort of fits. But that's sure. not, it's no. not in my mind for an instant what it was about. No. So for all the writers I've had the privilege to talk to, I never get a sense that they say, I'm starting with this issue. I, I, oh, I, yeah, I, no, no. I remember no. Um, yeah, Tim Winton's yeah. sort of talking about the fact that on those beaches in Western Australia, he would see a flicker, and the flicker was enough to be the beginning of a book. Did you have a kind of a what-if moment? Did you see a little kid that looked like Jimmy Flick? No. no, no. Was there anything like that that I you had... went, he 
here's this character. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd written a radio play um, in 2002, which was broadcast on Radio National, and one of the adults, there were, there were three inter, interwoven voices, three dramatic monologues, and they would interweave, and one of the characters was Pete Flick, and he was this anxious, medicated man, roguish and charming and, and homeless, and he was... Um, he was uh, a mystery to me, and I wanted to explore his childhood. I am drawn to perhaps um, uh, that which isn't always apparent on the outside. I don't know how well I'm describing it. I think you're describing it very well. Yeah, yeah so, so I know what it is. I've got an active imagination. That's what it is. So when I walk down that road, that Alma Road, and see all those kind of dusty, dirty, cobwebby, they sort of look like mansions, don't they? Old, old homes. And, and there are many... Um, I can't, I'm finding all the wrong, politically incorrect ways to describe well, you them. You go for it. But so there would be yeah. guys all over 70 who would hang around Alma Road on the outside of those derelict-looking mansions, smoking cigarettes and abusing me as I walked past. Now, a normal person might cross the road and, and, and turn a blind eye, but I imagine the lives inside and how did they get there and what... What happened on, on the road along the way to, to so put them So writers, there? as they move in their everyday world, are forever looking at what looks ordinary or whatever, and they're yeah. going, what's behind there? Even not conscious. Even not really? conscious. If you live on Alma, near Alma Park and you're going to walk through those buildings for 10 years or whatever, however long I lived in that East St Kilda pocket, you'll sit down one day at the blank page with the pen and your character will come and off you'll go and there will appear that home on Alma Road. And there will appear that guy who, who once, you know, who spoke to you in a certain way. Yeah, that's what it is. Every, everything's going in all of the time. Not, you don't have to be conscious, you don't have to take notes. It's all happening all that, the that time. That sounds like it's a strenuous kind of way to live, that, that sense I think, of No wonder all... I'm so tired. Yeah. <laughs> I think it must be second nature to me. Right. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do it, would I? It sounds so too hard. You're what, not saying, what you I want to show this world because I want people to have some understanding of this world. It's not, it, it, it's not it, a it, high, it, lofty kind of intention like that. It, I want it, others to understand that world. I want them to bring compassion to that. It, again, it's not conscious. It's, um, if I do try and find words to what is it that is driving me on every day to complete the thing, to be true to the thing, to meet its, de meet its demands and per perfect the thing, like a musician might write a symphony. That's, how I, that's what I liken it to. What is it that drives me to do that? It's the thing itself. The demands of the thing itself, the artwork itself must be done. Um, but there's ambition in there as well. I won't lie to you. There's ambition. There's, there's, there's all things mixed in. There's the, there's the meaning of the work so that there is something to express. There's, some, there's a place for me to put... put all the things that I struggle with on the page, so there's an outlet, as well as the art of the thing, as well as ambition, as well as needing a world to go alongside that of the domestic life and parenting, you know, needing that world to escape to. Um, and it's winning the Miles Franklin Award, is, is that part of the ambition? Or do you, uh, do you dare not even dream about that? Do you not... When I was doing it, you mean? Yeah, you, at that moment, you go, oh, I've got oh, a real gosh, chance. Oh, no, gosh, I didn't think it would win the no. Miles Franklin so Award. So you don't set God, out with no. that kind of I mean, No, no, I didn't, I didn't think no. of it winning that. Uh, but don't get me wrong, I'm not unaware of its power. Well, I'm affected by the piece as I'm doing it. Sure. But at this very same time, if nothing had ever happened to any of my writing, as in if it was never recognised, I would still be doing it. I would still be sure. doing it in exactly the same way. I'm certain that the outside accolades probably helped me help the writing because I gain, I, I'm forever trusting more and more my own instincts. I was wondering about that. Yeah, because I trust yourself it much more, more and more and more. Is the accolades of people that no, 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 it's not that. It's not practice, that? practice. No. You get sharper and sharper and sharper. Like, yeah, you just know what you're doing. Tell us about Jimmy Flick. Why did you choose the six-year-old boy who's obviously kind of on the autism spectrum, something like yeah. that? Yeah. Why did you choose? To, to narrate the story through that. I couldn't imagine anything more difficult. I mean... I wanted a character that didn't play by the rules. I wanted an unconventional character that pushed the boundaries of language. And I knew someone like him would because he's not particularly educated. He has an unusual mind. I wanted to see what I could get away with. And this is all done basically through that 
creative acting skill and that writing skill. Who knows? I just know that's where so I started. So you don't go and bury yourself in, in lots of research no, about, no. about children with no, that my kind whole of... I mean, your life is a sort of a research, isn't it? Like, sure. you'll do a little bit, sure. but you're a bowerbird. I mean, I must be. Sure. Early in your book, on page two, this is Jimmy narrating, and he's six at that stage. And he's looking at that beautiful refinery yeah. there. And through the high wire fence, I saw the body with intestines made of steel and no skin around its precious metal. I just thought that was amazing the way the world was suddenly stripped yeah. of its skin. Yeah. And you seem to... It smoke grey clouds and a flame blasted from the end of the huge pole like a giant pilot light. It was the same network that was in the rabbit that my uncle Rodney shot and pulled open. The same network that was in my mum. The same network that was in me, in plants and leaves and machinery and all shops and underground in the earth's core. It was the whole inside of all living things. But on the outside, that's where my dad worked. There, in that refinery. My mouth watered. I couldn't look away. I don't think I've ever read anyone who's taken this kind of under the skin. I think it's just most exquisite writing. Thank you. That's Bruno. the genius of your book. What what why did you why is that such a big part of, of the book? Because Jimmy is forever the molecules in him are always spinning, aren't they? You seem to always get into I almost that was that a conscious thing? Again, I, I yeah, I can't I can't give you a clever answer because it wasn't a conscious thing and I was affected by by the refinery. And so you know, if I if I go into that six-year-old's way of understanding the refinery, well, there are the words for it. Tell me about you as the writer standing front row to this violence that you know is going to happen, and you've got to you've got to portray it, you've got to write it. Yeah, I'm How okay. Is that? I'm okay. Is that I'm okay. Right? Yeah, I, it I, is. It is. It's kind of relaxed, sort of a process. It's. Um, I find myself writing over the top of certain scenes and I have to challenge myself to go back and write into the scenes, make sure you go into all that gritty, challenging territory, otherwise the reader is, you know, you haven't done the, the necessary work. But um, And how much? How much when you stay with something, how much do you let show and how much do you just hint at that. That's the I, art I suppose every it. artist yeah. asks that, a filmmaker yeah, says that. How long so, do you stay with Well, that? you can overwrite like crazy in your first draft. And that's where you, sh you know, that's where you can, and hopefully you'll have what it takes to um, go back and redraft and redraft and redraft because it's the space between the words and the lines. For you as a writer, what? Because this is your lifeblood. This is yeah. where all your creative kind of. It is. is what, what's it the is. story? The story can you give is us about a... undoing a knot, I think. Really? Yeah, it's about undoing. It's about it's about a knot that becomes impossibly, impossibly tangled, seemingly impossible to undo and finding a way to undo it so that there is hope and peace. Wow. That's tonight's answer. 